This is an audio sermon recorded at the Church of Christ at Johnson Mill in Fayetteville, Arkansas. We are Christians seeking to worship God in spirit and in truth according to the New Testament. Come worship with us Sunday mornings at 1030 at 3801 Johnson Mill Boulevard. That's a great joy to be here with you this morning. Um, looking forward to opening the Bible together and studying the scriptures. And, and I'm, I'm hopeful that what we study this morning is going to be uh, beneficial for your life because we need to learn and grow in the Word of God in order to be sustained in this life. And, and this morning, I want to talk to you about the concept of, of uh, integrity. Let me actually open this up here so you can see it. We'll, we'll talk about integrity this morning. It's a really important subject and a really important concept. Uh, we might hear a lot about that. You know, I listen to a lot of uh, leadership podcasts or business podcasts, and there's always a lot of talks about integrity. And, you know, usually you hear things about being honest and, and you know, keep being true to your word. And those are all true, and those are all features of integrity, but I don't think it strikes at the real heart of what it means to have integrity. And especially... Uh, how do we apply that as Christians and make sure that we are people of integrity uh, and, and consistent with the scriptures of God? Because we read passages like Proverbs 19, verse 1, and we see this word used in different ways throughout the scriptures. Better is the poor that walketh in his integrity than he that is perverse in his lips and is, fool, is a fool. So the Bible teaches us that it's better to have integrity, but how can we know unless we really understand what integrity is? And so... What does the Bible have to say about this? Uh, well, when you, look at, when you look at the actual breakdown of the word integrity, it comes from a Latin word, integer, and you might think of that in math concepts as whole numbers. And so the word integer means something untouched, something entire, something whole, something complete. <coughs> it is sound. It is uninjured. It is a, a, something that is whole and unified and complete. And so the word integrity gives us the idea, then, of wholeness. That's what really the heart of integrity means, to be a whole person, to have integrity. And as I was looking for passages and and studying this out in the Scriptures, you know, I noticed something interesting in the book of James. And, And there was a whole lot that the book of James has to do with having integrity and being a person of integrity. And so I believe this, this epistle shows us a pattern for understanding this concept of wholeness in that sense of the word of integrity, wholeness and completeness. Um, in James chapter 1, James introduces, he starts the epistle with a call and a plea uh, for them to understand. He sets and frames the entire epistle with this at the beginning, that it's about their wholeness. He says in James chapter 1, verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So there's some different words being used here. Last Sunday we studied with uh, Brother Jay. He brought a lesson about endurance. When we're going through trials, we should have endurance. And James here talks about having endurance, letting that be a good thing, viewing that as a good thing. Why? Because that endurance is a trying of your faith. You're being tested, and you're being tried, you're being refined, and that faith will produce in more endurance in your life. It'll produce the sense of patience. But let patience have her perfect work. We need to see that through all the way through the end. We can't give up in the process and, and fail in the middle of the process of going through this trial because then it won't have its complete work and complete effect on us. What is the complete effect of the trials and the things that we go through as Christians? That you may be perfect. That means complete, so that you can be fully furnished, so you can be fully uh, complete and entire and whole. So here's that concept. We go through things in this life that make us up, that make us and build us up to be better in our faith, to make us whole, lacking nothing. And so God wants us to be a whole person and have integrity. Um, And that word perfect there in this, the second word here, perfect, it's a sense of maturity. So it brings maturity to our lives when we go through trials, when we go through tribulations, when we endure temptations. It makes us more mature in our faith, and it makes us more of a whole person. So I want to personify this to you in, in looking at an example from the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 13, or in Acts chapter 3, rather, 
when the apostles and the you know in Acts chapter two the church begins and they're going out and, and preaching the gospel and they receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit and they're going about healing people. Um, so in Acts chapter three we find and encounter someone who is crippled. He's sitting there at the gate of the temple, and he's looking for help and he's begging for help. And and Peter and John come to the gate of the temple and they stop and at him, and he looks up at them expectant of some of some money. He, he thought that he was going to give him something. And Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but what I give, uh, what I've received, I give to you. And so he says, in the name of Christ, rise up and walk. And so this crippled man who had a problem, his body was not whole, his body had a problem, he was unhealthy, and he had parts that were broken, parts that were not working and functioning properly, so that made him incomplete. He had that problem, but Peter, through the power of God, makes him complete. And so he explains that to the audience. They're all dumbfounded, and he goes into the temple praising God, and he's leaping and he's walking when he's never done that before, and the people see this obvious change in this man. And Peter says, why are you all looking at me and John like we've healed him with our own power or our own holiness? It's, it's through the power of God that this man was healed, and he explains this in verse 16. And, and his name, the name of Christ, because he convicts them there at the temple. He says, this same Jesus, the one uh, by whom this power comes, is the one you crucified. He says, and it's his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him, the faith that comes and, and is through Christ, has given him, the crippled man, this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So let's personify that idea and concept of holiness and I think it's personified here in, our, in a spiritual sense for us. We are the crippled man who have weakness, who are broken, who aren't functioning properly. We have things missing in our lives that are causing us to be fully functional spiritually. But the power of God and the faith through Christ completes us and makes us whole and gives us perfect soundness. It gives us this concept and this, uh, the reality of wholeness. Okay, And so... This man now, he was incomplete, and now he is perfectly complete. He is perfectly sound, completely healed. And so Jesus will do that for us, and that's the entire goal. God wants us to be a person of wholeness. In James chapter 1, he says, Blessed is the man that endureth. You know, he goes on after he lays this, this, uh, frame, this initial thought, framing the, the epistle to them, saying, Endure temptation, because it makes you a whole person. He goes on and he talks about the, the brother of low degree, a poor person, a brother low degree, being happy that they've been raised up by Christ, and the, poor, and the rich person being happy because they've been humbled. And so they've been, they've been, the, it's been, they've been leveled now in Christ, the, the brother of low degree and the brother of high degree. And where we put value on either of those and think one is better than the other, James makes it a point to say none of that matters. Ultimately, your status in this life doesn't matter. But what does matter Blessed is the man that endures temptation. That's what it's all about. It doesn't matter if you have money or you don't have money. What matters is how you deal with the temptation that comes in your life, how you deal with the struggles, how you deal with the trials, how you endure, and how you mature and grow. Because in the end, when we're tried, we'll receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love Him. That's the goal we're all working towards. And that's the reason we need wholeness in our life. We need to be a whole person, a person of integrity. Peter also talks about this concept. In 1 Peter chapter, six, or chapter 1, verse 6, he says, Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. There's a whole lot of things going on when these, when these apostles are writing to the church in the first century. They're being persecuted. They're being scattered abroad. The Roman government is oppressive. They're being tortured. They're being killed. They're being murdered. And he says... Endure this heaviness. Endure all these temptations. And not only are they dealing with these external problems, they're dealing with internal problems in the church because there's false doctrines. The doctrines of the Gnostics is taking hold and is taking over, and it's leading Christians to be sensual, and it's leading Christians to be worldly, and it's leading Christians to fall away from the truth of the Scriptures. And so these are all the things the church is dealing with. And Peter says, endure heaviness through these temptations, these manifold, these many temptations and obvious temptations that the trial why what's the reason 
that we should endure these temptations. The same thing that James says, that the trial of your faith that is much more precious than that of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and the glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Peter it relates going through temptations like think of our faith as a precious metal, gold in this case. He uses the illustration. And we're being put through a refiner's fire. So the things that we go through in life is refining us. And that fire is... When, you're, when you put these metals through this intense heat, it tempers them. So you can work out impurities this way. Uh, when you melt gold at a, an intense heat, all the impurities rise to the top and you scrape this off. It's a process of refining gold. But then also this heat treatment will make it, it'll work out the impurities, make it clean and pure, and it'll solidify it and make it much stronger than it was before. And so that's what happens to us in our faith when we go through all of these difficulties in life and all the things that happen to us. We're put in this, this state of heat and pressure so that we can come out more consistent, so that we can come out stronger against the future trials that will come. All working up to the goal of being found in praise and honor when Christ returns because that's what we want. We want to be found as a whole, precious person in the sight of God. First Thessalonians, Paul lays this idea down too in First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. God is able and capable and does because this is what He wants from us. He wants our soundness to be found. He wants us to be found completely and uh, totally pure. And, and when, God, when the God of peace sanctifies us, he says the God of peace sanctifies you completely and totally. And so when God sanctifies us, he, that's what he's doing. And this process of sanctifying us is to make us totally pure. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who will also do it. So the idea here is that, that the sanctification we receive from God, we're to, to continue to grow in that and to remain in that sanctification. And uh, the way we live points to the coming of Christ, and it all kind of leads up to this. And we ought to work to be found blameless in our, in our soul, in our body, in our spirit, our whole person. And I want to notice how, the, the, or how this verse ends here with saying, Faithful is he that called you who will also do it. So he says, You be a whole person. God is capable of sanctifying you totally and completely. So you be a total and complete person because God is a total and complete person. What he says he will accomplish, he's going to do that because that's the character and the nature of God. And so the next thing I want to point out in this understanding of how to be a person of integrity, how to be a person of wholeness, is to be whole like God is whole. Be a complete person. Be unified, be one, be singular the way God is singular. James points this out in the, in the book of James, there in, in chapter 1. <clears throat> in verse 17, he said, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness. There's no inconsistency with God at all. Neither shadow of turning. There's not even a sense or, or a suspicion of doubt that God is going to change who He is because God never changes. And that's what this verse is highlighting to us. That's the Father. He never changes. He is consistent. He is one. He is complete. He is whole. And notice what it says. Of His own will begat He us through the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. And if the Father is whole and invariable and He doesn't change and He's not turning to the left hand or to the right, but He's singular and He's focused and He's one and He's united, the children should be that too. We should be a reflection of that, that our great God, and that, that idea and that quality of being whole. If the Father is whole, the children should be as well. That helps us to understand now what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. He says, But be ye therefore perfect, complete, whole, as your Father in heaven which is perfect. He is consistent in his character. He is consistent in the quality and the nature of his heart and his mind and his thought and his actions. It all is perfectly aligned. And he says, you be that way. 
be perfectly aligned, be complete and be whole the way your Father in heaven is complete and is whole and is perfectly aligned. Jesus is that example for us, you know, because we have the problem of our sin and the problem of the weakness that we have, the inconsistency in our life. Jesus comes into this world to solve this problem and show us the way and show us how to have this proper alignment between our our heart and the Word of God so that our actions are also aligned uh, with the will of God. In John chapter 12, verse 49, he says, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak, and I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said to me, so I speak. You see, he gives us this perfect example of having wholeness in our life. The Father's will is the standard. Jesus says his heart is aligned to the standard. Whatever God has said, that's what he's going to do, and that's what he's going to teach. That's what's inside of him. And because of that, the actions that Jesus showed, uh, he speaks what he has heard from the Father, that's the action of the speaking, it shows and proves that he's in alignment and one with God's will. And so everything, it, it's like this completeness when you, when you look at this picture of Christ and how he followed and obeyed and taught the word of God. He wasn't out speaking the word of God and then not living under those commandments like the Pharisees. That's why he came and rebuked the Pharisees. They said one thing and did another. He said... And he did exactly what the, the Father wanted him to do. So he was in alignment. What he believed and how he lived was in alignment with what he said. It all is, is one thing and, and complete. I hope that's making sense. <clears throat> in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul gives us some, an important principle. If Jesus is the one who came and did this perfectly, then he does something very special for those who are belonging to him, those who are his followers. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, it says this great miracle of the resurrection, this great power that God displays that he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Because Jesus is who he is, he will complete the work that God gave him to do, and that is to mend our unsoundness, to mend our brokenness, and make us whole, and fill up our lives. So I imagine this this brick or this foundation with all these cracks and all these chips and all these missing pieces and we don't know how to fix that we can't it's impossible but jesus because of his power and his authority is is what we need to fill in those gaps and then it just totally consumes us and it makes us something different and something better and something whole again because of his fullness and that's where we should find our completeness is through Christ. Colossians 2, 9 through 10. For in Him, in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus is God in the flesh. And you are complete. You are made whole. You are made c- completely furnished for everything that you need to be this kind of whole person in Christ. Isn't that such an amazing blessing? which is the head of principality and power. We were like the crippled man in Acts 3. We are the crippled man in Acts 3. But Jesus comes along and his, through his name, through his power and authority, and through faith in that power and authority, he has made us whole again if we belong to him. And that's a special blessing. And, and if that's the case, we've been begotten by the word of truth, we should be like the Father with, with whom there is no variableness, And we should be a whole person like God is a whole person. And so James, as he unveils these thoughts and rolls these these concepts out in this epistle, in chapter 1, he lays out something very important for us to understand in this idea of making sure our heart and our life and our actions are aligned with the will of God. And the warning and the concept is that of inconsistency. That's something we need to know about. 
That's something we need to talk about. That's something we need to be aware about in our own selves and our own weakness that we have. Though Christ is making us whole and trying to make us whole in a complete person, we have this problem of inconsistency in our life because of our habits, because of our heart, because, of, because we rely on earthly wisdom rather than God's wisdom. And remember, he said, endure temptation so that you can be mature, perfect, and you can be entire, lacking nothing. And so he continues that line of thought by saying, man, if you lack something, if you lack wisdom, in, in James 1 verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, you're missing something. There's a piece missing that's making you, keeping you from being complete. Ask God who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. He's not going to chide us. He's not going to mock us. He's not going to laugh at us because we need help. He's going to give us and, and bountifully. He's going to provide that wisdom and it shall be given him. So God will fill up those weaknesses and make us a whole person. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. If we're going to go to God and ask him to fill up our inconsistencies and make us a complete person and repair us, we need to be sincere about that request. Don't be double-minded. Don't waver. Don't have variableness. For he that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. You're just going any direction, whatever is, temptation is coming in your life, that's what's dictating how you, that's how you feel, and that's how you react. It's just based on the situation and the moment. You're not grounded in something greater. Let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. This idea of inconsistency, we're warned about this. We need, if we're asking God to help us, we need to be true in that desire, or we will not receive the help that we want. And a false attitude is described as having a double mind. That means you're trying to do two things at the same time. You're trying to serve two masters. You have two dueling and competing interests. And, the, and James warns us about this type of inconsistency. Jesus warned about this kind of inconsistency. We talked about the hypocrites, the Pharisees. And that's what he called them, hypocrites. In Matthew chapter 15, 7 through 8, he said, You hypocrites! Well did Isaiah the prophet prophesy of you, saying, This people draws nigh to me with their mouth and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. What was on the inside did not match what these people were saying, and they're praising God, and they think they're so holy, and they're presenting themselves as some great thing. But you know what they're doing? That word hypocrites, it means a stage actor. And what do stage actors do? They pretend. They play a part. They want to be seen as something that they're not really. They're not portraying reality. And that's what these Pharisees were doing. They come nigh to God with their mouth and, oh, I love God and He's so great, but where's their heart? Not aligned. It is inconsistent. And therefore, they're stage actors and they're hypocrites. It's like somebody wearing a mask. And we do that. The inconsistency in our life causes us to wear a mask, and we try to pretend to be something we're not, we try to pretend that we're holy, uh, or, or that we're something better than what we actually are. And for some reason, the, the idea pops into my mind about what I see on social media, and, and there's been a rash of this for a long time, but, but people will get on there and put these weird face filters on to try to make themselves look way different. And their eyes look really big and weird, and it they, like, has this special makeup on their face, and it like makes their face look thinner and it's just like oh i'm so beautiful and you see these people like post these pictures on about the, or of themselves and are constantly updating their profile and they want to prove how beautiful they are but then you go to see them in real life and they don't look anything like that that's that's the concept here that's a that's a way for us to understand and relate this concept when we're talking about god we cannot put a filter on our holiness and trick God and to think and, and make him think that we're something greater than what we are. He sees right through that. We cannot play the part of wearing a mask and, and being stage actors. We have to be true in our holiness and our heart and our speech and, and our will has to be aligned with the will of God. That's what it means to have consistency. When we're doing this, we're being inconsistent. James 1, he gives an example uh, of what this kind of inconsistency leads to. Because to be a consistent person is to seek the will of God to fill up our lives. We're asking Him for His wisdom to help us. 
But when we're an inconsistent person and we're double-minded, we're going to look elsewhere to try to fill in those gaps. And that's going to be a problem. James chapter 1, 13. Let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So we start to, to get this false idea about God in our minds when we are embracing temptation rather than trying to endure it and push it away. And so we start to embrace it and try to fill our lives with these wicked sins, and we think that's going to help us, and we start looking at everything backwards as if God is the one who's putting this temptation before us and making us sin. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. He pleads with them, don't err. Don't commit error. And if we do, we shouldn't blame the one who is perfectly consistent with whom there is no variableness or shadow of turning. Inconsistency in our life is our own fault. It's not God's fault. And we need to own that, that idea and, and embrace that and understand that error will, will cause us to become compromised. When we, when we talk about, um, you know, you might hear this in, in architecture or in, in manufacturing. If there's a material, there's a building, or there's something that a part is broken or is missing or the foundation is strong, the structural integrity is compromised. That means it's weak. It's not going to withstand what it was built to withstand. And so error is going to cause us to be compromised. Our integrity will be compromised. We will become corrupt, and it will ultimately lead to us failing. And the failure is we don't receive that crown of life. We're not found pure and blameless before God. Embracing temptation as a way to fill up our wholeness or our gaps and try to mend ourselves through these things and medicate the way we feel because we know we're broken through these sins, it's not going to help us. It's only going to hurt us more. But we get backwards and we think it's going to help us. Now, there's some examples of this. Matthew chapter 19. A young man who is very wealthy comes to to Jesus and he says, Master, what can I do to inherit eternal life? How can I get that crown of life at the end? How can I stand before God blameless and pure and holy and receive that great gift? And Jesus says, keep the commandments. Honor your father and your mother. Don't kill. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man says, well, I've done all those things from my youth up. And Jesus said, yeah, but you're missing one thing. You're lacking one thing. In Matthew 19, verse 20, the young man said to him, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? What am I missing? What's the part that I need to be filled so that I can be a complete person, a whole person? What am I lacking? Jesus said to him, if you will be perfect, you want to be a whole person and complete, Go and sell what you have and give to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus asked him these questions and gave him the information he needed, and he exposed the inconsistency in the life of this young man. He thought he was fine because he'd done all these things, but he knew there was a problem. How did he know? What, what am I lacking? Why would you ask that? Unless you know and realize there's something amiss in your life. What am I missing? And Jesus exposes the the inconsistency. He has a covetousness problem. He wants to keep all of these things that he's amassed because he was very wealthy. He had great possessions. And this error of covetousness had caused this young man to fail in attaining eternal life. That's what inconsistency will do in our life if we don't root out these problems. Um, James gives some examples, too, of how this inconsistency plays out. And he was writing specifically to this, to this group of Christians that he's writing to, and these must have been problems that they were facing. One of those problems was their inconsistency was showing in the way that they were treating people. He says in James 2, verse 1, 1 through 4, My brethren, have not the faith of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Don't treat people differently who you think deserve more respect. For if their 
come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and saith unto him, Sit thou here in the good place. And you say to the poor, Stand, stand thou there, or sit under my footstool. Are you not partial in yourselves and have become judges of evil thoughts? James points this out and he uses the word partial to show that you are now divided in your intentions and in your actions. You're showing partiality. You're treating one person better than this other person. Rather than the great command that we have to love our neighbor as ourselves. And our neighbor is is everyone. And we should love them as ourselves. Why would we show respect to this person with wealthy clothing? He has a gold ring and he's... Imagine if somebody came in and he's drives up in a limousine, he's wearing a suit, and his shoes are shiny, his hair slicked back, and he just is, is em- embodying this image of wealth. And we're so impressed by that. And we're like, hey, you can sit right up here in the front. You're our special guest. But then a homeless man comes in with vile raiment. It smells. It's dirty. It's disgusting. And we're, sh- well, we don't know if we, man, it, it's making the room smell really bad. And maybe you should sit over there in that room back there. Maybe that's what that person should do. And he says, if you've done that, aren't you, instead of being a whole person in how you react to people and how you treat people, you're partial, you're divided, your intentions, your attitude, your heart is divided now, and you're showing respect of persons. And he said, aren't you become judges of evil thoughts? You're causing a problem. You're being inconsistent. We shouldn't have two standards of how we treat a visitor to the assembly. And, and to be partial, again, is to be in parts or divided or acting in an inconsistent way. He gives another example as he continues to develop this thought of inconsistency in our lives. He uses the example of the tongue, which we already saw was a very important thing when Jesus said, I hear the will of the Father and I speak the will of the Father. And that indicates to us what's in Jesus' heart. James points out the use of the tongue and how we use our words as a, as a possible point of inconsistency. In James chapter 3, verse 8, he says, But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith we bless God the Father, and therewith we curse, curse we men that are made after the similitude of God. Do you see the inconsistency that he's laying out here? We bless God. Oh, God is so great. But then we look at man, and we treat man as some vile thing. Look at this dumb person. I can't believe these people. And we treat them as inferior, we treat them as, as ridiculous, or we insult them in some way, and we curse them and blaspheme them. That's inconsistent, because that person is made in the image of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be. It shouldn't be this way. It is unnatural for us to be an inconsistent person. It is unnatural for us to be divided and have our allegiances and our thoughts and our intentions and our desires and our goals divided. We should be a complete and whole person because that's who God is. That's what's natural for us to be like God, the Father. It is unnatural for us to be divided this way. Does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? No, that's not natural. That doesn't happen. Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? No, a fig tree is not going to produce olives. And an olive tree isn't going to produce figs. That's unnatural. Either a vine, figs, so, so, uh, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. It's impossible. It's not natural. It's not right. It's, it's weird when there's something inconsistent like that. And it's weird when, it's in, when we're inconsistent and we bless God. Oh, praise God. He's so holy. Thank you for this blessing. And we turn around on social media. Look at this dumb politician. Look at this dumb Christian. I can't believe they believe that. That's inconsistent and it's not right and it's not natural because man is made in God's image and we ought to remember that and show a love and honor and respect because of that very quality because they are made to be like God and it's, and it's exposing an inconsistency. This is a problem when we have a divided heart and we have inconsistency. Matthew chapter 12 Verse 13, 33 through 35. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. 
And we're sitting here and we're thinking about all these things that we've done, and maybe you're asking yourself, how do I know if I'm living inconsistently? Just as what Jesus said. Look at what you're producing in your life. Look at the actions that you're producing in your life. And be honest about that and say, is this consistent with God's will or is it not consistent with God's will? Because the tree will be known by its fruit. If we go by an orchard and there's a whole bunch of trees out there and there's these fruit that are growing on there, we will know what kind of tree it is because of, uh, we will know what kind of tree it is because of the fruit that is hanging off of those branches. It might be apples. And we'll drive by and say, that's an apple tree. We can identify it based on what it's producing. We can identify if we're consistent or not based on what we're producing. Either we're a healthy tree that's producing healthy fruit, or we're a corrupt tree, a tree with disease that's producing rotten fruit and diseased fruit that can't be eaten. All it's good for is to be cast out. Jesus uses that idea of, of the tree and the fruit that it produces in, in multiple times. And he says here to these to these hypocrites, to the Pharisees, Oh, you generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. This is why the emphasis on speech is placed when Jesus talks about he speaks and does the will of God. And why James uses his example of speech. Because speech will identify, it's the fruit of, our, uh, of what's in our heart. And will identify if the root is healthy or if the root is not healthy our speech. Out of the abundance of the mouth, or the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good, good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. The mouth simply spews out what's in our heart, and an evil tongue is a result of having our heart misaligned with the Word of God. Because when that happens, it's going to cause our actions to be evil bad, corrupt, unsound, unwhole. So we can know because of the, the result, the speech points to the origin and the state of, of our heart. So <clears throat> we need to be mindful of this inconsistency. And the last question I want to bring up as we explore this idea of being a whole and a complete person, how can we grow in holiness or in wholeness? There's kind of a, a pun there. If we need to be holy as God is holy, I think. Um, so that's the question. How can we grow in wholeness? That's what we need to know the most. How can we develop this? You know, because the truth is we're not going to be perfect overnight, and we're, not gonna be, we're never going to be completely sinless and, and uh, unable to falter. But the more we grow and mature, the more we'll be able to withstand and the more we'll be able to say no to those temptations. So what do we need? James points this out too, there in James chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. He says, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. God wants us to be like him. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. Sometimes we're quick to talk. But we need to be quick to listen, slow to speak. Don't be so quick to, to speak. Be, don't be so quick to get angry, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. It is inconsistent and will not produce good fruit. It will not produce the righteousness of God. Wherefore, here's the solution. Lay apart all filthiness, all this impurity, all the brokenness, all the, the sins, all the trouble in our life. Lay that aside all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Be true about our desire. If we want God to fill up our weaknesses and heal and mend our brokenness, we need to be true about that desire and receive with meekness that word that is able to save us, that is able to help us and fill up our hearts and fill up our lives and make us a whole person. But it's not just enough to be receptive to it and say, I want to know what God wants me to do and how... I'm asking him for wisdom, and, and I want to receive that wisdom. Instead of being a double-minded person saying, I want wisdom from God, but I don't want to do anything about it. We're not going to receive the wisdom we need. But if we do, what do we do? Be doers of the word that we're receiving with meekness. And don't deceive your own selves. Don't, don't let that mask fool you. 
that, oh, well, I, you know, I asked God for wisdom, and I, I was crying, and I was tearful, and I, I humbled myself, and I was down on the floor praying, and I just feel so much better now. And, oh, I went to this study, and I saw this, this thing in the Scriptures, and I, that's just what I needed. But then we're not actually doing the Word of God. We're not actually making changes in our heart. We're not actually letting it transform us. That's deceiving ourselves. We're fooling ourselves with the mask. We're, we're blind to our own problems. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man beholding his natural face in the glass. And he gives this example of somebody looking in the mirror, they walk away and they totally forget what they look like. James uh, 26, I'll jump to verse 26. He says, If any man among you seem to be religious, but does not bridle his tongue, you don't control what you're saying, you don't control your heart, because remember, what we say is a result of what's inside of us in our heart. Uh, We're not bridling our tongue and controlling that, but we're deceiving our own heart. This man's religion is vain. The worship you're offering to God and the way you're trying to live your life is inconsistent and therefore it's vain, it's empty, it's meaningless. But pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. And in those two things are embodied the two great commandments, loving your neighbor as yourself, visiting the fatherless and the widows. That's loving your neighbor as yourself. And keeping yourself unspotted is loving God with all your heart and your mind and your soul and your strength. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 2, or 22, 37. Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, whole and complete, all of your heart and all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first great commandment, and the second is like it. Thou shalt not... Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There's a similarity and, an, and something inseparable about those commandments. One is like the other. And if we're not going to love God consistently with all of our heart and mind and soul and be a complete person, it's going to, to change the way we treat our neighbors and it's going to make us inconsistent. James points this out too as a great example of following and receiving and hearing the word of God and doing the word of God. He says in James chapter 2 verse 8, if you fulfill the royal law, which we just read, love God with all your being, all parts of yourself, and then love your neighbor like you love yourself completely and totally, then uh, if you fulfill that royal law according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. Good. But if you have respect of persons, he's bringing their attention back to the thing that they were doing, respecting this man with wealthy clothing and disrespecting the man with vile clothing and vile raiment. He says, but if you have respect to persons, you commit sin because you're impartial, or you're partial, remember? And you're convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. For he has... For he that said, the same God that said, don't commit adultery, also said, don't kill. Now, if you commit no adultery, and yet if you kill, then you become a transgressor of the law. You see, you cannot be an inconsistent. You can't say, well, I'm keeping this commandment. I'm not keeping this one. And then expect to be a complete and whole person. You have to hear and do the word of God. And he says, so speak ye. And do as they that shall be judged of the law of liberty. Be the kind of person who speaks because your heart is aligned with the word of God. And do, let your actions be aligned with that. As people who are judged and living under the law of liberty, the word of God, bring yourself back into alignment. For he shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy. And mercy is rejoicing or is triumphs over judgment. What does it profit, my brethren, if though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? No, because it's incomplete. It is not whole. So we need to make sure our actions are showing that our heart is true. And it's not just an act, but our heart needs to be true and aligned with the Word of God. Because this is interesting. If we don't love our neighbor as ourself, and he gives this example of showing judgment without mercy. You know when we fail and we sin, you know what we want? We want mercy. We want people to take it easy on us. We want people to forget. But if we go around not treating people that way, 
and we hold this against them, we constantly bring it up, we have no mercy towards them, you should have not failed, and I'm, there's no way I'm going to forgive you for that. If we have judgment without mercy, because we're partial, then we will receive God's un, unpartial judgment. He will give us total and complete judgment against ourselves because we've showed no mercy. But, so we need to be people that live, that receive with meekness the engrafted word, live under these commandments and make sure our heart is aligned with the will of God so that our actions are aligned with the will of God. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, he says, where your treasure is, what you value, what you care about, what you love is where your heart is going to be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye be single, your eye is focused, it is, it is whole, or single as in uh, healthy, not focused, it's, it's healthy, then the whole body will be full of light. You'll know exactly where you're going, you'll be able to see clearly, you'll be able to take action as you're, as you're moving forward to, to your destination. But if your eye be evil, meaning unhealthy, there's a problem, it's diseased, then your whole body will be full of darkness. You won't see where you're going, you won't see what you're doing, you won't understand. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? It's a terrible state to be blind and not be able to see the problems and deceive our own selves and say, well, I'm a, I'm, I received the word of God, but I'm not doing it. And you're deceiving your own self. That's a terrible state to be in. No man can serve two masters. It's impossible. It's unnatural. For either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold up the one or hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So when our loyalties are divided, our heart is divided, it causes inconsistency that will cause us to, to fall away from God. We need to have our lives filled with the light of the truth so that we can see clearly our problems, so that we can apply this wisdom that we've asked God to give us to fill up these inconsistencies and repair these things that are broken and these things that aren't working and properly functioning. Can the fig tree, James continues with this line of thought, can the fig tree, brethren, bear olive trees? No. Either a vine figs. So can no fountain both yield salt, water, and fresh. When our heart and our life is aligned with the will of God, it's going to show. It is go because by your fruits you will know them. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation. You're not showing out of a desire to wear a mask and, and pretend and falsify who you actually are, you're just letting your actions speak for themselves because your heart is aligned out of a good conversation, a good heart. Your works are just going to be displayed naturally. Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and do not lie against the truth. Don't be false against the truth. You're going to be inconsistent. This type of inconsistency of having envy and strife in our hearts is not wisdom that comes or descends from above, from God. It is not holy, but it is earthly wisdom. It is sensual. It is demonic. It is devilish, he says. Because what happens when we have this inconsistency in our life? Where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. The point is we need, how do we grow in this wholeness? We need the Word of God, and we need to receive it sincerely and with meekness. Because when we try to become whole with the things of the world, envying and strife, and we think that's going to get us what we want, it's going to leave us confused. It's going to leave us empty. It's going to leave us more broken than when we started in the first place. And we're going to wonder why things aren't getting better in my life. How come I'm not feeling better? How come things aren't actually better? How come my relationships aren't better? How come my actions aren't better? How come I can't get control of this sin in my life? And you know what it's going to cause? Every evil work, it's going to produce more sin. If this tree is corrupt, it's going to produce corrupt fruit. And so if sin is in our heart, it's only going to produce more sin. And that's going to grow, and it's going to spread to others, and it's going to disease the other trees around us, and our families, and our friends, and everything. And it's just going to have this ripple effect of producing more and more sin. Why do you think there's so much chaos in the world that we're seeing now? Because people are attempting to fill these problems with earthly wisdom, and all it's causing is more chaos. But 
if we are made in the image of God, if we are, have been reborn to Him through His Word, and we have been made whole through God's wisdom, that is perfect. He says, the wisdom that is from above is first pure. It is totally consistent. It is clean. It is right. There's nothing wrong with it. It's pure. Then it's peaceable, and it's gentle. It's easy to be entreated. It's open to reason. It is full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality. It's not divided, and without hypocrisy. It's not an act. There's no mask that God is wearing when He gives us His wisdom. He gives us true and and honest intentions and purpose. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. If, If we fill our lives with God's wisdom, we're not going to have confusion. We're going to have peace. And what's interesting about the word peace is it means to set at one again, to make us whole. And we're going to have a sense of wholeness and a sense of peace in our life. And you know what that's going to produce? More peace. It's going to help you as you are in your journey of growing and maturing (laughs) As a Christian, it's going to bring more and more peace. And it's going to help you be a person who produces peace. If you are seeking peace in your life and you're working towards that peace, it's going to cause you to go and sow the fruit of righteousness and peace. And it's going to produce more righteousness from God if we rely on His wisdom and not earthly wisdom. And that's our goal, to be like this tree in the parable of the sower in Luke 8, 15. But that on, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and a good heart Having heard the word, keep it. They do the word of God. And what do they do? They bring forth fruit with patience. It, they take the time. We put in the time. We put in the effort. We're growing these fruits. And we're seeing this all come to fruition. We're, we're, we're seeing it all come to completion. And we're producing these wonderful fruits of righteousness. But the warning is if we hear and don't do the word of God, we are committing sin. James 4.17 Therefore, to him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is a sin. We need to be consistent. When we hear the word of God, consistently apply it and bring ourselves into alignment and do it. Don't leave off from doing what we know is good. Because if we hear it and reject it with our actions, then we're committing sin. And the other thing is having humility when we're receiving the word of God. Be humble. It says in James 4, verse 6, He gives more grace. Wherefore, He says, God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands. Remove the impurities. Remove the imperfections, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Get that partiality out of your hearts and purify your hearts and become a whole person when you're approaching God, seeking His wisdom. And if you humble yourself and submit yourself to that wisdom, He will lift you up and He will give you peace. There's one more thing I want to point out as we talk about these concepts and we hear these things. We know our failures. We know our weaknesses. We know our inconsistencies. And the blessing is that when we humble ourselves and come to God, He will help us. And the other blessing that is in James is the blessing of coming together in prayer over these inconsistencies and seeking help from one another. That's the other blessing. You don't just have God in your corner. You have the family of Christ in your corner wanting to help you grow. James chapter 5, James 5 verse 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Faithful is He that promised. He will do it. He will sanctify you completely. If you've committed sins, God will forgive them. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Let God, through the help and aid of your brothers and sisters in prayer, help your unbrokenness or your brokenness be healed. We're the crippled man in Acts 3. Let yourself be healed and made whole with perfect soundness by God's amazing sanctification and His grace. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. If you're here this morning and you're hearing these things and you 
feel this conviction in your heart. You know the inconsistencies and you want to do something about you're tired of relying on earthly wisdom and just running into more chaos and more problems and more division and more stress in your life and, and no peace. We're here. God is here. And we as his family, his children, are here to love you as we would love ourselves and show you mercy and show you uh, help and grace because that's what we would expect for us. That's what we want for ourselves. And do this so that you can be a whole person, not a person that is empty, that is sitting alone wearing a mask, trying to fool yourself, trying to fool your neighbors, trying to fool God. Be a whole person. I urge you to do that this morning. If you're not a Christian, then there's a huge piece missing in your life. And nothing you fill your life with is going to satisfy that emptiness. Ever. You can fill it up with all the games, all the parties. You can fill it up with all the, all the entertainment, all the social media you want. It is not going to fix your problem. Jesus, because of his resurrection, can make us whole again. And it starts with being baptized into Christ. And so, if you're here this morning and you want salvation from Christ, and you want to begin this refining process of becoming better and stronger in your life, it's here. All it takes is you to, to make up your mind to do the will of God. Be baptized into Christ, have your sins forgiven, and start this life. And if you're here this morning and you are a Christian, you have been baptized into Christ, and you need prayers, do not be ashamed to ask for help. None of us should be. Don't wear a mask. Don't pretend to be stronger than you are. Ask for help. We're here, and we love you and, and want to make it a welcoming experience for you to, to confess your faults and to receive help from God so he can lift you up and forgive your sins. I urge you to, to come as we stand and we sing. We hope you enjoyed this teaching from God's Word. To receive new sermons each week, subscribe on Google Play Music, iTunes, Spotify, and like us on Facebook. Thanks for listening, and God bless.